Every man and woman should be able to earn a living by some honest calling. But what exactly is an honest calling? In society, occupations such as firefighters, doctors, and clergymen are generally held in high regard. There's a good reason for this. All of the previously mentioned jobs' main purpose is to care for people. In contrast, we as a culture often make jokes or look poorly upon individuals who choose careers involving bothering or harming citizens. Telemarketers, politicians, and lawyers are just a few examples of this phenomenon. The last of these I want to examine a bit closer today. Lawyers have a stigma attached, whether fair or not, that they are bloodsuckers that only care about money and are willing to lie at the drop of the hat. An attorney is much more than just an ambulance chaser. Sometimes a lawyer is a student or an advocate of the law and can affect change in not just the courts and legislation, but in everyday life as well. One of the most influential lawyers in American history never practiced law, but her contributions to the legal system are still being felt to this day. I'm Matt Dahlberg, and as the first female lawyer from Illinois, Myra Bradwell is a hidden gem of history. In the mid-19th century, options for a proper education were extremely scarce, especially if you were poor, a minority, or a woman. For Myra, learning was an innate desire that she needed to be fulfilled. Young Myra and her family moved from Vermont out to the Chicagoland area around the age of 12 years old. She went to primary school in Kenosha, Wisconsin, but her first taste for secondary education came when she attended a female seminary in Elgin, Illinois, and became an instructor there. Despite the name, female seminary is not a place where women become pastors, but was the closest thing to a college women could attend at that time. Spearheaded by the evangelical movement and those for women's equality, seminaries were transforming America for women, giving them the tools they needed to compete with the male workforce. However, the one thing women did not yet have were opportunities. Myra married a man by the name of James B. Bradwell in 1852. The notion of settling down now that she was a married woman never occurred to Myra as she continued her education in Memphis, Tennessee, again learning all the while teaching at a school headed by her husband. She was a certified school teacher and taught herself law by the time she and James returned to Chicago. James joined the Illinois Bar Association as an attorney, with Myra attempting to follow in his footsteps. She apprenticed under him and did pass the bar exam, generally the final hurdle before becoming a lawyer. Unfortunately for Myra, as was common for this age, there were extra barriers placed in her way. When she passed the bar exam in 1869, the Illinois Supreme Court denied her the opportunity to become a lawyer due to her marriage status. When that was successfully appealed, the courts restricted her on the basis of her being a woman outright. Bradwell's appeals proceeded all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1873. Bradwell and the counsel representing her performed admirably, arguing that Myra had the right to pursue any profession without limitation due to her position as a citizen guaranteed by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. The Supreme Court disagreed with an 8-1 to ruling against Bradwell, with only the Chief Justice Salmon P. Chase siding with her. What argument presented by the Illinois courts could have possibly persuaded the justices? That's the most egregious part of this, in my opinion. Myra's attorney was the only one to argue a case. Illinois felt it wasn't worth their time to even appear in front of the highest judiciaries in the United States, and yet they still won the decision. If anyone was expecting Myra to sit still while waiting to be given the chance to practice law, they would be sadly mistaken. In 1868, a full five years before the notorious Supreme Court ruling, Myra Bradwell started the Chicago Legal News, a paper documenting court cases and rulings as well as publishing legal editorials on current events. In addition, Myra used her paper to draw attention to social causes that desperately needed the attention. One of her first and unending pleasures was to promote and highlight every time there was a woman appointed to a position of power, authority, or honor. Myra made sure all of her readers would hear the news. Her subscribers would continue to grow until she was considered to be the editor of the most important legal outlet in the country, as well as one of the most popular. 
As a firmly established publisher, her next role would be one of her most successful, a lobbyist. The title lobbyist, similar to lawyer, has many negative connotations. People may think of politics and associate lobbyists with dark money. However, in the case of Myra Bradwell, the only thing she brought to the legislative and judicial houses in Springfield, Illinois, were the eyes of her readers. If there was a problem, Bradwell would be on it like a hawk. Bradwell suggested a new design for the courthouse. It was adopted and implemented. In only the third issue of her publication, she argued that women should be able to own property and the wages they earn be theirs and theirs alone. A revolutionary concept for the time, unfortunately. Shortly thereafter, the owner of a bar took money out of one woman's wages because her husband neglected to pay his debt. This would not stand. Myra drafted a bill and pushed it through the Illinois Congress. Most businesses believed they could deny someone employment solely based on gender, and until Bradwell helped persuade legislators to act, they unfortunately could. There was a reform school in Chicago that ironically needed plenty of it. While a school in name only, the institution was more or less a labor camp for orphans. As horrifying as it was reprehensible, Bradwell stood resolute. She published an article detailing the grim facts of the school, citing lack of scholastic opportunity provided to the children. When the school's superintendent attempted to refute her claims through a letter addressed to her, Bradwell could have ignored it. Instead, she let her audience decide what was true and published the letter unedited. In the end, Bradwell prevailed again, forcing the Chicago Reform School not just to close, but to be totally abolished. Myra Bradwell changed her society for the better, but it wasn't just for her time. We have been feeling her impact in our everyday lives ever since. Myra fought tirelessly for the rights of the accused, the rights of witnesses, and the treatment of those who were found guilty under the law. Most people know some version of the Miranda Laws. You have the right to remain silent. But before Myra, you didn't even have the option to testify on your own behalf. Believe it or not, witnesses were sometimes treated much worse than even the accused. Myra changed the way courts and law enforcement interact with observers of crime. They aided investigations and would no longer be seen as accessories to the crime. Even after a person was found guilty, Myra insisted people still deserve respect. She helped eliminate the barbaric punishment of whipping. Prisoners were not the only people incarcerated at this time. The mentally ill were treated with no dignity and were left to rot in confinement on some occasions. Mary Todd Lincoln was one of those such people. Miss Lincoln would be committed to an insane asylum in nearby Batavia, Illinois in the summer of 1875, but the Bradwells, who were friends with the Lincoln family, did not believe a woman of such grace and honor should be abandoned, especially if she was falsely confined. It turns out Mary Todd Lincoln was railroaded by her estranged son, Robert. Seventeen witnesses were called against her, all claiming she was mentally incompetent and must be restrained from the public. Her court-appointed defender never objected to any witness's statement or accusation. He didn't even call any witnesses to rebut the prosecution. Mary was blindsided. However, her captivity would last less than a year. Myra and James helped free the former first lady, with Myra emphatically declaring, Mary Lincoln is no more insane than I am. I guess the message got across. Mary was freed in May of 1876, and she did eventually repair her relationship with her son. One of Myra Bradwell's final accomplishments was one that should have been awarded about 20 years sooner. In 1890, the Illinois Bar Association approved her application to become a practicing lawyer and the U.S. Supreme Court followed suit in 1892. Tragically, Myra was unable to practice law at this time because she was battling with cancer. Her struggle ended in 1894, and she was laid to rest in a Chicago cemetery on the north side. 
The movement she helped partner and her legacy continued on. Her dream for women to have the right to vote was realized in 1920 when the 19th Amendment was ratified. Women gained the right to equal pay in the United States in the early 1960s, another vision Bradwell had. Myra Bradwell exceeded every expectation and stereotype society had for women, and then some. She persevered through a rigged system and accomplished more in her lifetime than most men, including her husband James. Myra was passionate, diligent, caring, and more than anything else, effective at what she did. Miss Bradwell is one of the greatest women I have ever read about, and I was only able to scratch the surface of her accomplishments and contributions to us here today. Myra Bradwell is a hidden gem in history. If you have someone in mind who you think should be highlighted as a hidden gem of history, or just want to learn about an undervalued time in history, feel free to email the show at hiddengemsofhistory at gmail.com with your suggestion. Hidden Gems of History could not be made without the help of so many people. This episode especially could not be made without my high school government teacher, Miss Oslager. During my time in high school, Miss Oslager was a full-time lawyer as well as a full-time educator. She was incredibly intelligent, was eager to share stories of her time as an attorney, and didn't allow any nonsense from her students. She wasn't the most popular teacher in school, but I learned so much from her. Thank you. I'm Matt Dahlberg, and this has been Hidden Gems of History.